thanks very much. Thank you for inviting us, and it's a pleasure to be here. So just to run you through our plan, um, we're going to tell you a bit about the study, tell you some of the results, um, focusing on some more than others, just for the sake of time, um, and in particular looking at preferred place of death as a research outcome measure and perhaps also as a proxy for a good death. So the story of this piece of research begins in 2007 um, down in Canterbury where we had a new chairman of our board of trustees who had just retired from general practice. Um, he had been a very passionate advocate of palliative care at home in his own practice and he asked us to think about starting a hospice at home service which at the time we didn't have. So just for the purposes of clarity, we already had a traditional, if you like, clinical nurse specialist based home service giving advice and support to patients with a multidisciplinary team and the CNS service was running nine to five, seven days a week. So hospice at home was to be an addition to this service. We decided that we would like to commission a literature review to see what sort of evidence there might be out there to guide us in setting up this new service and what sort of configuration might be appropriate. So we commissioned a literature review from the University of Kent and the findings, just to briefly summarise, were a very mixed bag of evidence about hospice at home Terminology is an enormous problem because all sorts of different services call themselves hospice at home. There's not much consistency in what that actually means in terms of the service. Um, there was a lack of hard outcomes in terms of things like perhaps preferred place of death or actual place of death. A lot of softer outcomes in terms of satisfaction and before and after changes. A lot of the evidence didn't really specify the service that it was relating to, so we felt there was a lack of explicit detail about service configuration in the literature. The things which did seem to make a difference and to make these services effective were these features. Uh, firstly, a rapid response, able to respond quickly over a 24-hour period. Uh, secondly, that carers are crucial to patient outcomes in this situation, and I guess that's fairly obvious, really. Um, and thirdly, that these services do best when they're supported by a full hospice multidisciplinary team. So we went ahead to devise our service on the basis of this information, and I'll just describe what the service looked like. So it was available to all patients referred to the hospice, it was available 24 hours a day at four hours notice. That was our interpretation of rapid response. It was available to support primarily dying at home. That was the real objective of this service, to enable people to die at home. But we did also expect that we might wish to put in some level of crisis intervention to prevent unwanted hospital admissions for people who weren't actively dying. We would have the support of the full hospice MDT and the CNS service which I've described to you. Um, but the service itself was delivered by senior healthcare assistants who were trained in the hospice. We had to estimate roughly how much care each case would require in order to staff the service appropriately. And we estimated approximately 72 hours of care for each case on the basis of data that we had available to us at the time. I guess at the outset we thought a lot of this might be delivered in long stretches of care, but that's not how it worked out at all, as we could discuss later. We were very keen for this new service to add benefit. Um, as you all know, um, home care and dying at home, palliative care in the community is a whole systems business. Um, and there's no point any one service trying to take over from any other. So we were trying to add in benefit where there were gaps in the current services. And our current services included all the hospice services I've described, 24-hour district nursing, Marie Curie services, social services, etc. So we were trying to fit in between the gaps in current services. Okay. The research evaluation was something that we decided to build around starting this new service. 
partly because we felt that there, was, there were considerable gaps in the evidence and we might be able to make a contribution to the evidence base. So we were very fortunate, and this is the first research grant I've ever applied for, and I was successful, so I got a completely distorted view of how this business works. I can assure you I've had some rejection since. Uh, but we were funded through the Research for Patient Benefit stream of the NIHR. And um, working with colleagues at the University of Kent, our outcome measures were, primary outcome measure was the achievement of preferred place of death. So the presumption was that most people want to die at home, and that if we facilitate that with the new service, then the achievement of preferred place of death would be increased. We also looked at carers, and most of our assessment was of carers. The only information that we gathered from patients was their preference for place of death. Um, but we sent out questionnaires to carers at two time points in the study, at the time of referral to hospice services, and then eight months later when the majority of patients had died. And the carers were assessed with HAD scores, hospital anxiety and depression score, and with other measures of health utility and quality of life, which we're actually not going to talk all that much about because um, we've prioritised other things to discuss today. Um, as I said at the beginning, end-of-life care is a whole systems business, so we were keen to have an economic evaluation um, to look and see what impact this new service would have on costs. And we also did some qualitative work with carers, and particularly a group of carers post-bereavement, <coughs> Uh, to explore some of their views of what makes for a good death. Right, so we took advantage of our three sites in East Kent, Canterbury, Thanet and Ashford, to design the research study so that we were looking at patients in cohorts. Um, the blue is the area of people receiving usual care plus the new service, the rapid response service, and the white is just usual care. So we randomly allocated the three sites and started the service in Canterbury. We actually had funding for the service from the PCT at the time, and we had planned a run-in six-month period to get data before starting the service, but that was rapidly dispensed with when the PCT said that the service needed to start, it, start in the financial year, and preferably now. Um, so off we went with Canterbury, and six months later, we rolled out the service to our second site, and six months later to the third site, but as you will already have guessed, we were collecting data on all the patients referred to the service throughout these time periods, so that we had <coughs> cohorts of patients who were and were not receiving or having access to the new service. Um, so over the period of the study, there were 1,700, just over 1,700 patients um, referred to the hospice who died within the research period. And they were split into the three sites, as I've described. Um, the eligibility line here refers to the fact that we didn't include patients who crossed over from one period of the study into another. So if a patient entered the study in a control period and then survived into an intervention period, we didn't include them because that would obviously complicate the interpretation. So that's the eligibility line. And then we only could only analyse the primary outcome measure for patients for whom we had a recorded preference about their place of death. So as you can see, about 62% of patients had their preferred place of death recorded by the time they died. And then they were split into control and intervention, as I've described. The control group is obviously smaller than the intervention group, and it's worth bearing that in mind when looking at the other numbers. Okay. So we had 688 patients in the intervention group. Now, it's important to remember that the intervention group was a group of patients who had access to the new service. They didn't all use it, but they were in the intervention group if they had access to the new service. Um, you're not going to be able to make much sense of this, so what I will do is just point out to you that we've looked at mean age, we've looked at gender, we've looked at place of occupancy, as in where the patient lives, uh, preferred place of death, actual place of death. And the significant differences here 
are for preferred place of death, where as it happens, in the control group, more patients prefer to die in the hospice, and in the intervention group, more patients prefer to die at home. And then the actual place of death is different, but I've got some more information about that on some slides that are coming up, which will be easier to look at at home. Um, but it's looking at the effect of different elements on the outcome, the primary outcome. So to remind you, the primary outcome measure was achieving preferred place of death, and the allocation, that is being in the intervention group or in the control group, um, did not have a significant impact on patients achieving their preferred place of death. There were some factors which did have a significant impact. One was living alone, which I think is well known, which reduces people's chance of achieving their preferred place of death. Um, two others with significance were if a patient preferred to die in a care home or preferred to die in hospice, then they were more likely to achieve their preferences. So now, we're now looking at some data without the preferences included, so we're just looking at where people died. And this group of patients died at home, and actually significantly more patients in the intervention group died at home. But that was regardless of their preference, i.e. whether they wanted to or not, really. Okay. So death in hospital, again, regardless of preference. So for patients who were referred to a hospice, which is where we started, and had expressed a preference, their chances of dying in hospital are, as you might expect, quite low, about 10%. But actually, that didn't vary whether they had the intervention or not. So the intervention didn't make a difference to that. But clearly, both of those groups had a low chance of dying in hospital of about 10%, whether there's a national average, as you know, is around 50%, perhaps a little over that. Death in hospice um, in this group of patients was significantly higher in the control group. So you were significantly more likely to die in the hospice if you were in the control group. And this we'll be reflecting on later, perhaps, to do with people expressing and recording preferences. There may be some, some relevant information in there, I think. Right, so in terms of the primary outcome measure, which was achieving preference, preferred place of death, about 62% of hospice patients who were entered into the study had a preference recorded by the time they died. We took a completely pragmatic approach to recording this information. We did not take a research type approach. So a research type approach might have been we're sending a researcher to get this information from all the patients um, through a structured or semi-structured process. We didn't take that approach. RFPB is very much about practical things that can be implemented quickly into healthcare. So we took the approach that hospice services should routinely be gathering this information. And that's what we encouraged our staff to do. We supported them and encouraged them. We fed information back to them about how well they were collecting this information. But that was all that we did. So this is a pragmatic sort of result. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, we could certainly discuss. Of course, it means that nearly 40% of people, we don't know what their preferences were. In terms of achieving their preferred place of death, about 60% of these patients achieved that, regardless of whether they had access to the intervention or not. And there was no significant difference. And I guess, certainly, that that rate was higher than what we had expected when we designed the study, and probably is relatively high for patients, if you look at all patients, not just referred to hospices. And then it was the case that significantly more patients in the intervention group did die at home, regardless of their preference, as I said. Um, I did mention care as quality of life. I'm not um, going to say a great deal about it because time doesn't allow, but we were comparing a number of rating scales um, at the naught time period and at eight months following referral for carers. And the key is that we were comparing the control and intervention groups. 
So when I say no differences were observed in terms of symptoms of anxiety and depression as measured on the HADS, um, in fact, carers did have considerable anxiety and some depression at the point of initial assessment, which had normalised eight months later. But the, there was no significant difference between the two groups, whether they did or did not have access to the hospice at home intervention. Um, again, there were no differences in physical aspects of quality of life as measured with the SF12 or in health utility between the two groups. There was a small difference in the mental components of quality of life measured on the SF12, but I'm, I think that's of questionable significance for reasons that we could discuss if, if time allows. Right, so just to think about preferred place of death as an outcome measure and also as a proxy for a good death or a successful outcome. Um, a few issues come out of the quantitative data that I've discussed with you. Um, as I've said, we took a pragmatic approach to recording for a place of death, but that means we only, if you like, had 62% of preferences recorded. I think it's well known that there's a percentage of people for whom we're never going to capture this information because they don't want to discuss it for reasons which are perfectly legitimate. Um, whether we could have captured a few more if we tried a bit harder is another question. But in the midst of a clinical service, I think 62% wasn't bad. But it does then beg the question, how useful an outcome measure is this? Because we've automatically then excluded a large proportion of patients. Um, also, of course, information is often recorded, but not necessarily in the right place, not in the place where your data analysts are searching for it. And certainly, when it comes to changing preferences, we recorded really not very many changed preferences in the study, and yet we know that people's preferences change as time goes on and as death approaches. And so, again, I would say, in a clinical service, it's quite difficult to capture this information once, let alone it's changing. That information may well have been known to clinicians and may well have been recorded somewhere in the notes, but not necessarily in the right place. Then I think we've all come across this, those of us who work clinically, that um, people don't always have a very clear concept of their preference for place of death. Um, and it's often not a single word answer. <laughs> Um, it's more likely to be something along the lines of, well, it depends on, and either here or there, if, what, when, how, etc. So again, when you're trying to nail this down for the purposes of a research study, well, we've got to have an answer actually, is it home, hospice or hospital, then you're starting to compromise um, the information. And then I guess another issue, which we, in fact we're talking about in the pub before we came in, was where is home? And um, I know that that's sometimes described as a usual place of residence, but for some people, care home is their home. For other people, it never becomes their home because their home is the place where they used to live and so on and so forth. So these are all issues with this particular measure, which we might want to discuss later. Right, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Heather Gates. Um, so, um, as Claire mentioned, included in the study was an embedded economic evaluation, uh, which we did, uh, with the data that was collected by Laura, the uh, research fellow that was doing the study. And the data that was collected was from multiple sources, um, and it was collected on all patient episodes, so all patients that were in the study. Um, had data collected for them from primary care, community services, the acute trust, uh, Marie Curie, out of hours services, social services, and the hospice services in general, and specifically the hospice at home service. The only exception to that was um, that not all GPs were able to find the time to come up with the data on the, the primary care use. So we only had data for 63% of the participants from GPs. So we took the mean value and imputed it from the others and put that in for the missing data for those. So having got the data on the utilization of these other services for all of the patients in the study, 
we then put a cost on those uh, using validated national unit costs collected by the Personal Social Services Unit um, at Kent. The idea behind this was to see whether there was any difference in the costs of caring for the, the, the patients in the different groups for whether they had the intervention or whether they didn't have the intervention. Now, clearly, the service use and the costs depends upon how long uh, the patients were in the study. And as Claire said, patients were recruited to the study when they registered with the hospice. So when they um, entered hospice care, be it for inpatient or for outpatient or whatever, uh, they became eligible for the study. And some of the patients were many months or several months, and some were only a few days. So the first thing that we had to do was to identify some time periods. We clearly couldn't identify, uh, analyze them all together because it made no sense um, when you'd have people, clearly people who were in the study longer were going to be using more services and be more costly. So we identified five time periods um, where the time period was the number of days between recruitment to the study, um, which was when they were referred to the hospice, and uh, the date of death. And the five time periods that we identified was 0 to 2 days, 3 to 14 days, 15 to 30, 31 to 60, and more than 60 days. That was done on the basis of looking at the uh, distribution of numbers of days, and that gave us relatively even groups. Um, in the middle, a smaller number of people, 0 to 2 days, and a larger number of people, more than 60 days. But the groups in the middle were more or less... Uh, were fairly even. Uh, so we then compared first the utilisation and then the costs for each of those different sorts of services um, between the intervention group and, first of all, between the intervention group and the control group in each of these time periods. And we also added all the costs for the different services together and compared it at the total cost level as well. So we did it for intervention versus control and we also did it within the intervention group where we looked at the people that had used the hospice at home service and compared them with the people in the intervention group who had not used it. Because although everybody uh, referred to the hospice was in the study, not everybody used the hospice at home service. So we, we did this analysis at these two levels. So looking first of all at what we found when we compared the intervention versus the control groups, we found overall that there was no significant difference in service use or in costs between uh, people in the intervention group and people in the control group at any of those, over any of those time periods. So that confirmed the basic hypothesis of the study, which was that the hospice at home service does not add significantly to the costs. And this is obviously at the population level because we've got in the intervention group some people that didn't actually, that, that had been referred to the hospice but didn't actually use the hospice at home service. They were using outpatient or other, other types of service that the hospice provides. So if we move on now to look at the comparison of the users of the hospice at home service compared to the non-users of the hospice at home service within the intervention group, we had about 36, well 36% of the people in the intervention group actually used the hospice at home service. The remaining 64% didn't. There was no significant difference in terms of age, gender, or length of time in the study between the users and the non-users. But the users of the hospice at home service were more likely to state a preference for dying at home, to actually die at home, and to be dying where they wanted to. Those three things are connected. So there may be something that needs to be explored here between cause and effect. Um, if they were users, were they, were, were they users because they wanted to die at home, or was it because they were users that that became their preference to die at home? The users had a higher primary community, Marie Curie and out of hours service contacts and costs for most of the time periods that I've mentioned than the non-users did. So again, one asks the question, could that possibly be related to the fact that they were uh, using the hospice at home service? Could it be because they were higher users of these services that somebody suggested that they might benefit from the hospice at home service? There may be a, a connection there. 
So just looking at a few more specific uh, results, when we look at this comparison within the intervention group between the users and the non-users, um, the users who were in the study for between 3 and 14 days had less hospital use than, than the non-users. So they used A&E less, they had less hospital inpatient, they all also had le less hospice inpatient care than the non-users of the hospice at home service and hence their costs were lower. So again, we can't say that there's, there's a, a cause and effect here, but we can simply say that there's an association. It's possible that the, exist that the fact that they had access to the hospice at home may be the reason why they had less A&E inpatient uh, care. That probably was the um, most secure of the findings. We also looked at, uh, when you looked at total costs uh, across all of the services, there were some tendencies for some significances, but nothing that really tended to paint a very uh, sure picture of what the findings were. So the users had higher costs than the non-users um, uh, in the 0 to 2 days and the 31 to 60 days categories. Um, and that was result, as a result of them having the hospice at home input and because they were using primary and community services more. On the other hand, the non-users had higher costs than the users in the 15 to 30 day time period. There was no significant difference in the costs between the users and the non-users who were in the study for between 3 and 14 days or more than 60 days. So the evidence is inconsistent between those time periods. There's nothing very much that we can say uh, about that. So finally, um, we asked the question, how much would the hospice at home service need to save uh, in terms of off uh, alleviating other services for it to be cost neutral? And the mean and the median cost of the hospice at home input to users of that service rose, as you would expect, with the time those users were in the study. So for those people that were in the study and using the hospice at home service for between zero and two days, the mean cost of the hospice at home service was £205. For those users of the hospice at home service who were um, in the study for more than 60 days, the hospice at home service input was valued mean of £1,111. Um, but you can see from the difference between the means and the medians that actually the distribution of these costs was very, um, very uneven. So there were very big variations between patients in terms of the amount of hospice at home input that they had, whatever the time period they were uh, in, in the study. So the last thing really is just to, is just to come back to the point that I've made before, this issue of possible selection bias. Who is it that refer was referred to the hospice at home service? If it was already the heavier users of services, um, well, is it the, the people that were already the heavier users of the service? In which case, um, that there may be a stronger case that they are offsetting uh, other, they're replacing other services. Right. So I'm going to talk about the interviews that we did for the study. Um, we did uh, interviews with 44 carers about six to eight months post bereavement. And um, the aim of the interviews really was to understand um, the carer's end of life experience with the patient, um, how they judge a good death, and particularly the role of health and social care services and the hospice at home service in um, shaping that end of life experience. Uh, we tried to get a range of um, care experiences, and um, so we selected our carers based on whether the patient had achieved their preferred place of death or not, um, and whether they'd used the hospice at home service. So the table here shows you um, the patient's preference on the rows and their actual place of death um, in the columns there. So we had a range of experiences. Um, 19 of the patients actually used the hospice at home service. Um, most patients had a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, we had slightly more female carers than male. And uh, most of the carers were the spouse or partner of the patient. Right, so just a brief overview of our, our methods and process that we went through. Um, it was myself and a colleague who conducted the interviews. Um, we piloted our topic guide with five carers and then refined it. 
Um, we used the framework approach to um, analysis and um, we cross-checked each other's coding to make sure we were using the framework in the same way. And we used um, NVivo software to help with the coding and analysis. So the first thing we really wanted to do was understand um, how carers perceive the end of life. And um, really, it, it was quite a variable time period. Anywhere from sort of the last week to the last year of life was really how they described the end of life. Um, uh, so, but basically, it sort of started um, during an acute sort of decline in the patient's condition. Um, this might have been around the time of diagnosis or terminal prognosis or just sort of very ill health. And then, of course, it included the actual time of death. Um, and then also the time immediately after death, which was sort of a time of reflection, um, which sort of helped shape how they sort of um, perceived that whole end of life experience. So we identified eight themes um, from the interviews, and obviously I won't have time to go into them in detail here, but just to give you sort of a brief overview. Um, so the first one was really that um, Karis talked a lot about um, coping with the patient's illness um, and how it really changed their normal routines and really redefined the way they lived. They talked about having to live day to day rather than planning ahead. Um, and there were a lot of concerns about being safe at home in the context of dealing with rapid deterioration and difficult symptoms. Um, maintaining a meaningful social role or keeping a reasonable level of um, engagement with the outside world beyond the end of the bed um, was important. And I have a quote here. Um, this quote sort of demonstrates how um, the hospice at home team actually helped to bring the outside world into the patient, and um, really by just talking about mundane things like the weather. Um, and actually, in this quote here, um, the patient was in a coma. And, um, but they still treated him you know, as a living person, which was really important to the carer. Um, professional relationships obviously were um, quite important in shaping the end of life. Um, carers appreciated when professionals used their initiative, took an interest in the patient's care, were flexible, and also when they worked together with other professionals. Um, carers were often critical of the care that they gave, um, and the way they reflected on the end of life was often an assessment of how they felt that they had performed, whether they felt they had done enough for the patient or whether they felt they had failed in some way. Um, so carers were appreciative of professionals who recognized that carers have limits to the knowledge and that they're not actually trained to care. And uh, a number of carers took um, steps to prepare themselves for the patient's death, and for some this was just a practical task about sort of asking about what signs or symptoms to expect as the patient was dying. Um, for others, it was more of a sort of spiritual or emotional preparation in, in sort of coming to terms with the, uh, with the patient dying. And so the actual moment of death, it was quite important to the carers that the patient was not alone. And indeed, some carers actually didn't want to be with, alone with the patient. Uh, carers very much wanted an environment that reflected the personal nature of dying, so the environment was calm, peaceful, and respectful. Um, the way the patient appeared at the time of death was also quite important. One of the key themes was feeling that the patient's body was controlled, so that symptoms were managed, that patients weren't sort of writhing in pain or gasping for breath. Um, and the issue of consciousness versus sedation came out, and then this is what this quote here demonstrates, um, that um, quite often carers wanted the patient to be conscious if at all possible, and, um, and with the quote here, is, this is what that's talking about. Um, the fact that not being sedated was actually the right decision so that um, her husband actually could be in control of sort of his dying. And, um, and lastly, the time immediately after death was quite important because it was a time really to reflect on what had just happened. Um, and actually, professionals were quite important, important at this point um, because they could explain anything that had happened and provide reassurance to the carer. And so then, if we're just going to summarize briefly what a sort of a good death is, it might sort of be summarized in the following. That a good death is, um, means that the patient was able to maintain a meaningful social identity as a self-determining person up until death, which means continuing to be a part of family life, maintaining normality, dignity, and control. So then, I wanted to explore a bit about how then preferences tie into um, a good death, as preferences were really the focus of the study. And I think preferences are important in the sense that they're an expression of control. It's really sort of a statement about what you want to happen to you at the end of life. 
Um, it can also be related to your values or priorities. So sometimes patients would say, you know, they want to be, they want to die at home because they want to be with their family. So really the priority um, is sort of being with family and home is thought to be associated with being able to achieve that. However, for some patients, actually, achieving the preference seemed to be unrelated to the end-of-life experience. Um, this was particularly for people who died at home, that um, perhaps they had expectations about, about what dying at home would mean, sort of being in your own beds, um, you know, maybe falling asleep, sort of going in your sleep, but actually the reality was far different, and, um, and so, in a sense, that achieving your preference had nothing to do with the quality of actually dying, that it was a poor death, actually. And then we just have a summary slide, if you'd like to. Thank you. So we thought we'd just um, briefly summarise our key messages. Um, so reminding you back to the beginning when we were talking about the primary outcome measure, which was achievement of preferred place of death. And for this group of patients, um, it's already quite high. The access to the new hospice at home service did not significantly affect it. The new service did enable more people to die at home. The new service was cost neutral across the whole system in the way that we've described, although Heather obviously then went into far more detail in some instances. And I think the whole process of this research has led us to think quite a lot about preferences, a preferred place of death. <coughs> Uh, how they're recorded, whether they're a good outcome measure for either research or clinical services, and whether, in fact, they are any sort of proxy for a good death. We think probably not. Thank you very much.